like to welcome everyone to this session. We look forward to it, look forward to what the Admiral has to say. With that, I'm gonna introduce our Executive Vice President responsible for education and advocacy, Greg Kishishian. Greg? Yep. Thank you, Frank, and uh, thanks to everybody for being here. This is our latest in our illustrious seven-year series of national security briefings, and we're very fortunate to have our guest speaker with us today. So let me just take a quick minute and introduce Admiral Oaken. Uh, Rear Admiral John A. Oaken is a native of Syracuse, New York, and he graduated from our own SUNY Maritime, which is uh, something for us to take pride in. Uh, he holds a master's degrees from the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, as well as from the Naval War College. Uh, during his Naval career, he served at sea aboard the USS Ticonderoga, CG-47, as well as aboard the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, CDN-69, and he's held significant shore staff positions as well. He currently serves as the commander of the Naval Meteorology and Oceanography Command, and in that capacity, he leads more than 2,500 military and civilian personnel. So it's a very significant responsibility. He's also designated as the oceanographer and the navigator of the United States Navy. Uh, I have to say personally, we met uh, Admiral Oaken during Fleet Week here in New York City back in 2018. And Admiral, it's taken us a little time to, to, to get you on board, but we're so pleased that you could be with us today. So uh, the floor is yours, sir, and thanks again. Great, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I gotta apologize for my voice. Uh, I lost it overnight for some reason. So I think hopefully everybody can hear me, but it is a yes, little rat. Yeah, loud and clear, sir. Video. Oh, sorry, uh, share content. I'm gonna help uh, iCloud Drive. Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, first I really do wanna thank you uh, for this opportunity to talk about uh, America's Navy put in context a little bit about what's going on around the world, uh, and then the drive home, the critical role those 2,500 men and women, uh, naval oceanography uh, do in support of national defense and uh, safety and resource protection uh, for our Navy. Uh, I didn't know Admiral Winnefeld was going next. Uh, I'd rather go before Admiral Winnefeld than after. Uh, Sandy Winnefeld's a, a great American, great Naval officer, and I, I know your next uh, briefing with him is gonna be just world class. Um, but as you said, hey, I am a proud New Yorker. Um, unfortunately, I haven't lived in New York since 1991 when I graduated from SUNY, uh, but I was born and raised in uh, Syracuse, as you mentioned, uh, attended SUNY Maritime from 1987 to 1991, and that's where I graduated. I also met my, my lovely wife, Valerie, who is a native of uh, Catskill, New York, from the town of Catskill, exit 23B off the three-way. Uh, and we have we have very very strong and fond memories of uh, of our time at New York Maritime, and it's great to see that school uh, doing really well under uh, Admiral Alfultis uh, and really prosperous. Because uh, I I no doubt am the naval officer I am because of my my heritage uh, in both upstate New York, but then my education at at our nation's first and foremost uh, maritime academy. Um, one, uh, one aspect that I do want to talk about is uh, I am the oceanographer of the Navy, the navigator of the Navy, but I'm also the hydrographer of the Navy. So uh, with my team, I'm responsible for the collection of hydrographic, uh, hydrographic information, which is basically the, the geography, the seafloor uh, outside of our EEZ. So all the, ex, uh, all the foreign data collects all the way up uh, to uh, other countries uh, territorial waters, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about the capabilities uh, in the community. But, uh, you know, we were born October 13th, 1775. We all know that. But I got to tell you, our forefathers were absolutely brilliant. Uh, they put in they put in early to raise an army, but provide and maintain a Navy, uh, which are critical. And so uh, before I get really too deep, I want to share a quote. Some of you may have heard before, but it's from, from George Washington. It dates back to the late 1700s, uh, and it goes like this. As certain as night succeeds the day, that without a decisive Navy, we can do nothing definitive, and, and with it, everything honorable and glorious. I'll say that again. As certain as night succeeds the day, that without a decisive Navy, we can do nothing definitive, and with it, everything honorable and glorious. So it, it's that Navy's mission, that enduring mission, uh, to provide con uh, prompt and, 
and sustain combat incident to operations at sea uh, for the last 245 years that have kept our, na our nation uh, safe, protecting our interests around the world, uh, preserving the peace, and most importantly, uh, protecting the homeland. Uh, it's no surprise to anyone that, you know, the Earth's covered by 70% of water, uh, but three, three really key facts and then one national security fact that I think some may, may not um, uh, think about a lot when they talk about why we need a robust and strong Navy. And that's 90% of all trade occurs on the global commons through, through the water. 26% of U.S. jobs rely on global trade. 26% of U.S. manufacturing jobs depend on exports. And for the first time in 400 years, the Chinese Navy is operating outside the second island chain. The, the first time in 400 years, the, the Chinese Navy is operating outside the second island chain. Providing open sea lines of communication uh, are, are critical to our national uh, security and our blue economy. Uh, and revisionist powers, Russia and China, wish to upend that liberal ward order and, and replace it with the authoritarian one. And I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really being pointed on that one. Uh, there are there are people on the water and underneath the water right now trying to upend uh, the, lib the, the liberal world order uh, and prevent us from operating freely and with our friends operating freely on the seas. So it's that 340,000 sailors, uh, 56,000 officers, uh, 279,000 enlisted, a couple with our 280,000 uh, civilians that operator, 300 plus ships, uh, 20, uh, 63 underway deployed right now and another about 80 or 85 underway, uh, again, to promote uh, American interests, protect uh, and preserve the peace and protect the homeland. I mentioned a couple of these challenges. I want to just sort of walk you around the world uh, and talk about some key issues that we've got in the Navy uh, and what uh, your naval oceanography is doing uh, about it. The maritime commons are congested uh, and the problem is becoming increasingly complex uh, and troublesome. From, uh, from the Sea of Japan uh, with North Korea and their continued efforts to develop nuclear uh, ballistic missiles to the South China Sea where two thirds of, of all global trade pass through uh, and China's building, uh, reclaiming uh, islands as their own uh, homeland and wish to re-baseline um, the law of the sea there and prevent free and open, uh, free and open operations uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, over in the Central uh, 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 Southeast Asia, uh, Afghanistan continues, we're, we're starting to slowly ramp down on that. Iran continues to be a regional, um, um, a regional problem. Um, the Straits of Hormu in the, in the, between the Arabian Gulf and the Arabian Sea and then the, um, uh, the uh, choke point between the Red Sea um, and the Gulf of Aden is becoming increasingly complex with counter piracy uh, and violent extremist organizations operating out of Yemen. Uh, we still continue to have a fairly good footprint uh, in the central, uh, fifth fleet in the central command AOR, but we are slowly rebalancing that uh, to seventh fleet, South China Sea, Philippine Sea, uh, and then into the Mediterranean and high north. Uh, in the Black Sea, Russia continues to be an antagonist to peaceful nations, uh, Romania and Turkey in that area, uh, and, and, and on, the, on the border of hostile actions uh, towards U.S. ships and airplanes that op operate uh, freely in, um, in the Black Sea. The Eastern Mediterranean is becoming increasingly Russian uh, as they continue to base submarines, aircraft, and surface ships uh, out of Tartus, Syria. Uh, and conduct increasing number of operations in the Eastern Med. So that free flow of traffic that we are, are, have become accustomed to from the East Coast through the uh, Straits of Gibraltar, through the Med and the Suez is become increasingly contested uh, and increasingly uh, heightened tensions. On top of that, we're operating up in the uh, Baltic uh, be between uh, the UK and Denmark and the North Sea and then in, uh, into the Baltic with our standing forces uh, um, NATO standing forces. Uh, we've got a couple ships up there right now uh, operating peacefully. Uh, and then we've seen a number of deployments. Uh, uh, right now, USS Ross is up in the high north uh, patrolling the Norwegians in Barents Seas 
uh, and that's becoming increasingly uh, increasingly routine for us. Uh, the bottom line with this one is your Navy is forward. Your Navy is forward, protecting the national interests, uh, and your Navy is our way team. You don't see them a lot operating on the east and west coast uh, routinely. Those are for those are for exercises uh, and workups, and then we deploy because we are America's Navy team. Navy's away team. Uh, and naval oceanography is that portion of the Navy that provides home field advantage to the away game. Um, as you said earlier, we have a team of about 2,500, about half civilian, half military. Uh, my headquarters as the operational commander is here at Stennis. Uh, and I, op I have six uh, 06 commands, six captain commands uh, around the world. Two of them here at Stennis, one in Monterey, one in San Diego, one in Washington, D.C., and another one in Norfolk, Virginia. And I'm just gonna sort of walk you around some of the capability that we uh, deliver to the Navy, which uh, I would call it is fairly exquisite. And a lot of people uh, don't really think about uh, understanding and dominating the physical battle space. Um, they just think about you know weaponry and kinetics, but um, the bottom line, if you're gonna win the next war, the next conflict, you must know more truth about the environment than your enemy. It starts with the information domain the technology edge uh, that, that we once uh, really had significant over China and Russia is evaporating. And you can see that as China and Russia develop quieter submarines, uh, fifth generation aircraft, uh, stealth aircraft, uh, uh, increased, increasingly technologically advanced uh, surface platforms. Uh, the nation that's going to control the commons is the nation that's going to have to, is the nation that's going to understand the physical battle space from the bottom of the ocean to the stars. And so we operate six military survey vessels around the world, the Pathfinder class. And uh, I'm gonna show you the next picture, but we had the blessing to be able to bring USNS Maury TAG-66, our, our uh, most technically, technologically advanced uh, survey vessel into Fleet Week, uh, New York in 2018. And we had her in Staten Island with more than 4,000 visitors over the, over the weekend. We have a seventh, tag ship being built right now. It'll be the final ship of, of the Pathfinder class being built over in VT Halter Marine, uh, over in Pascagoula. We operate 200 plus unmanned underwater vehicles. Uh, these are full ocean depth, 6,000 uh, meter uh, vehicles all the way uh, to, sur to surface gliders, surface drifters and, and, and ocean gliders. And in the sort of the bottom middle, you can see uh, about 10 uh, ocean gliders that are on the back of one of our TAGS vessels that uh, we deployed in early 2018. And we were the first operational command in the world to operate more than 100 unmanned underwater vehicles uh, at one time from one location. I'm pretty proud of the team for pressing the envelope there. Uh, also on the right side, you'll see an unmanned underwater vehicle uh, with a sailor's hand in it. That's a Mark 18 Mod 1 uh, Remus 100 meter. It's a hydroid built but we use that for, uh, for uh, finding and fixing um, uh, mine -like, mines and mine-like objects. We also run a suite of global and regional ocean and atmospheric models from the bottom of the ocean to the top of the atmosphere. We run the Navy's uh, only assured global environmental model. This is an atmospheric model that runs at 19 kilometers. It's world-class. Uh, and we are the world leader in ocean modeling with our global uh, uh, ocean forecast system. Right now, it runs at 112th degree, and then early in uh, 2021, uh, we'll bring that down to 125th degree. So very high resolution, clearly the world standard in uh, ocean and atmospheric modeling. We also run the Earth's, the, the, the nation and the, in the, in the globe's uh, global uh, first Earth systems prediction capability. This is a fully coupled ocean, air, land, and ice model that provides us predictive capability uh, in the ensemble out to uh, 45 days. Uh, the nation, uh, National Weather Service and NOAA, they're still working on, on theirs uh, and expect to put their ESPC uh, based on the global forecast system that uh, National Weather Service runs. We put ours into operations this summer uh, and we'll put the deterministic, the, uh, the daily run out to 16 days uh, later this year. Uh, we also run the nation's clocks. Uh, these are uh, a suite of um, uh, rubidium fountain clocks. They run at the Uni uh, United States Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C. Um, time is critical to every aspect uh, of naval operations from 
uh, network time protocol uh, to precise navigation to precise weaponry. It all does really start with positioning, navigation, and time. And so we're the world leader in, uh, in time and time dissemination. Uh, with, our, with our partners at the Univer uh, United Kingdom Hydrographic Office, uh, we also run uh, and, and produce the, the global star catalogs and the celestial reference frame. Uh, in the top, top middle of this image, that's our 26 meter uh, telescope that we keep on the sky 24 seven, 365 um, uh, mapping stars, uh, not only star location, uh, drift, uh, but also brightness and that, that feeds the star catalogs. We also have a satellite, a satellite observing system out at Flagstaff uh, that we put on the dark dark skies, along with a network of uh, of sat of network of telescopes, with our partner nations around the world, uh, from Chile to the Azores uh, to France uh, and out into the Western Pacific. We run an unmanned uh, we run an undersea warfare um, and a electromagnetic warfare reachback cell here at Stennis Space Center. Uh, this is a, a a, a team of, of subject matter experts in electromagnetic and undersea uh, warfare that leverages uh, high-end supercomputing uh, to do some pretty heavy and exquisite forecasting. Some of it I really can't talk about at this level, but it really does bring, uh, uh, bring the capability of undersea dominance to the submarine force. Uh, and those are, those are critical reachback cells for us. Uh, we run two super com computing centers, one here at Stennis Space Center, but another one out at Fleet Numerical Meteorology and Oceanography Center in Monterey. Uh, we run uh, our models on all three classification levels, so we need super computing power from unclass uh, to secret to top secret. We have about 11 petaflops of uh, super computing power uh, across those three enclaves. We have two fleet weather centers, one in Norfolk and one in San Diego. Uh, these are predominantly sailor focused, uh, uh, both enlisted and officer, uh, and their sole focus is to protect our nation's, uh, nation's investment, uh, our aircraft, our submarine, our surface ships uh, through in, -right, in route weather forecasting, optimum track ship routing, aircraft, um, aircraft forecast, uh, and then they have two, su uh, two sub commands, subordinate commands uh, that deploy small teams of anywhere from two uh, to uh, 13 people uh, on surface ships uh, to theater HW cells uh, to large deck amphibs and aircraft carriers. Two, two smaller commands that you may or may not have heard of uh, that are really critical and they're, they're our nation's only capability in these two realms. One is the Joint Typhoon Warning Center in Pearl Harbor. Uh, the Navy is responsible for all typhoon forecasting from the Eastern Pacific uh, to the Indian Ocean and from the, the North Pole to the South Pole. And we do that through a small team uh, in Pearl Harbor. Uh, that's the Joint Typhoon Warning Center. This is a, this is a smaller instantiation of the National Hurricane Center uh, in Miami, but equally is proficient uh, in, in the, the workload that that team has forecasting typhoons is about threefold to what the National Hurricane Center runs. Uh, we also have the Naval and National Ice Center in Suitland, Maryland. This is a tri-service organization, uh, Navy headquartered with a, a naval oceanographer, uh, a commander, but they also have NOAA and Coast Guard personnel uh, located, and that's on the Suitland compound where the Census Bureau and the Office of Naval Intelligence is also. We wrap all this capability that I've talked about, all the people, all the number of commands um, through, through the Naval Oceanography 2025 lens. Uh, and that lens has uh, three aspects, people, capabilities, uh, and innovation. It is clear uh, across the Navy, but, but specifically in Naval Oceanography, uh, the number one asset, the center of universe is our people. It's the, it's the subject matter experts uh, that, that bring to life the capability uh, and the innovation. Uh, we got a couple of key initiatives going on around uh, uh, right now that intend to deliver in the next couple of years. I'd like to just talk about a few of them. Uh, one is the, the non-hydrostatic unified model. It's called Neptune. This is the full, first uh, global fully non-hydrostatic uh, model. Uh, this is a, a model that's been in, in development with the Naval Research Lab in Monterey, uh, the Net Naval Postgraduate School, and Fleet Numerical Meteorology and Oceanography Center in Monterey. This is a game-changing model. 
uh, we expect to bring it into into operations in fiscal year 22. Uh, this model will allow us to temporally and spatially change uh, the horizontal and vertical resolution of the model uh, in time step. This allows us to use our limited supercomputing capacity uh, to focus on the problems uh, in the forecast areas where we uh, where we think it's most important. Uh, and so th this is a this is a game changing model. No, but nobody in the world is doing this because it's been it's, it is very difficult to run a fully non hydrostatic model around the globe. Um, but we're going to get it done. and It's going to make make a significant advantage uh, to us in the future. The other is uh, is our partnership with industry and academia through the advanced naval technology demonstration. Uh, Antex, uh, as it's termed, is a partnership that we've had with Newick uh, Newport. Uh, and we've uh, we've been three years involved with this. Uh, we now have our own uh, Antex Gulf Coast, where we where we look for in, uh, industry and academia uh, to come together with us to look at cutting edge uh, unmanned underwater technology uh, to put it against the the emerging problem sets uh, that I have uh, in my community, like fully autonomous surface vessels for hydrographic survey and how we could use machine to machine and AI uh, to, to navigate the rules of the road and to have a couple um, uh, voyage management systems that we have on our big ships. How can we get that smaller and on board our small surface vessels so that we can navigate safely in and around harbors where there's a lot of traffic? The other one is, um, is leveraging the Antex uh, to really speed up uh, what I call speed to the fleet. And that's these technologies that are typically in the Navy or in the DOD could, could take five to 10 years through big acquisition cycles. Uh, we're able to uh, go with small businesses and, and get some of these cutting edge technologies in small numbers uh, out to our team. Uh, one of them is that uh, you can see the USS Arizona and that's the Teledyne Z-boat. Uh, that, that, that capability bore out of Antex uh, and that is the, that that vessel right there uh, surveyed the Arizona for the first time in uh, 2018 during the rim of the Pacific. It's really these collaborations with industry and academia that are really making a difference um, and really broadening a horizon uh, on how how can we harness the nation's intellect, uh, both in industry and academia, to make my my team of 2,500 uh, stronger. And then lastly, before I open it up for questions, I, I would do want to have a big thank you uh, to the Navy, uh, Navy League uh, New York uh, for New York Fleet Week 2018. Uh, the picture in the bottom middle is the USNS Maury uh, sailing into port uh, for uh, Fleet Week. Uh, I was there with my team. We had about 300 on deck. You can see some of my smiling uh, sailors there uh, operating uh, and talking to young, young people, trying to get them in, engaged. Uh, in science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, and then in the bottom right, that's, uh, that's a, a uh, reception that I hosted along with my counterpart, uh, Admiral D. Mewborn, uh, on board Maury um, uh, in Staten Island. And with that, let me say thank you, and I'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Admiral, and thank you very much. I, I have to admit, um, when I lived in, I'm originally from New Orleans, and when I drove over to Gulfport for my reserve duty, I'd pass your sign with your command as I passed via Bay St. Louis on the Stennis Space Center. Never realized the full extent of your scope of command and with the and how important it plays. Um, my, my first ship was an ASW ship frigate. And, uh, we're, you know, relying upon all the information that was provided in, in tracking submarines was you start realizing how important, you know, the work of, of your command and your people do. So um, I, I think I speak for all of us when we say thank you. And thank you to everyone there for that. I do have one question. I'll start off with a question and then uh, I, you have one from a, a, one of our participants already. But from your perspective, what's the biggest challenge facing your command and in, in the span of your command today? 
it's the proliferation of my intellectual capital to China and Russia. Um, that's why um, we have a lot of people that want to talk in the open about our future capabilities. Uh, and I have no doubt, uh, this is my government iPad. I have no doubt uh, China and Russia are listening to what I say. Uh, and I'll just give you an example. In, um, in 2018 at Sierra Space in, um, in uh, DC, uh, I spoke on an Arctic panel and I talked about uh, the limited number of observations that we have up in the Arctic uh, and that we really need to get a global fleet of not a hundred gliders or 150 gliders that I operate now, but I need it. We need a fleet of a thousand gliders. Um, two months later, uh, my counterpart on the Chinese hydrographic uh, service came out and said, they're getting a plan for a thousand gliders. Um, so we really have to, to be very careful about protecting our intellectual capital. And we do that, we do that through cybersecurity uh, in, in talking in, in, in coordinating on the right networks. Uh, and so I'm driving my command off of unclassed networks and onto the uh, secret and uh, SCI because uh, th those are unsecured networks. Um, there's no doubt the cyber, cyber actors, uh, non-state actors, but also China and Russia are actively trying to steal uh, our secrets. All right. Yeah, it's always uh, that it's a challenge both uh, across the services and also with industry also. Um, so I have a question from Charles Weissman, a friend of our, friend of our council. It's a little lengthy, but I'm gonna read it. For decades and decades, ASW forces and tactical operations have relied upon bathothermial graph or BT profiles and later XBT, expendable bathothermal graph profiles for the prediction of, of the local underwater acoustic environment from ships and uh, Tashian, something I'm very familiar with. Unfortunately, in, in actual use, these thermal measurements are generally static and stale and they lead to inaccurate detection, detection ranges, range predictions, excuse me, resulting in increased search time, fuel, and resources. However, significant improvements in the accuracy of predicting the local underwater acoustic environment can be realized by adding the use of acoustic or in situ acoustic measurements of transmission losses in tactical scenarios. The question is, why does not the Navy, and specifically the meteorological, meteorologically, sorry, <laughs> uh, and oceanography command, uh, re-examine this institute measurement concept for improvement of predictive analysis in the tactical battle space. Wow, I, I uh, is this Ch Charles Weissman? Yes. I, 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 I tell you, I did not see that question, uh, but, but let me go on. Uh, be, I, I completely agree. Let me tell you what we're doing about it. So, so BTs continue to be important, but it's those, um, it's those sensors, those gliders that I show you right there, but also uh, Argo profiling floats, Alamo floats uh, that are providing those in situ measurements in areas where it matters uh, to ASW. Um, we, we have well over uh, a thousand uh, profiling floats around the world uh, in areas that matter to us, in areas where we're going to want to prosecute uh, or potentially have that additional reach. Uh, and so we, we have these sensors uh, on board our platforms uh, at sea, ready to go into the water uh, when, when, the time, uh, when the time calls. So uh, BTs are important, uh, but these systems, like these unmanned systems, like these gliders that uh, are continuous temperature and depth um, sensors with an optical sensor that give us a more refined sound velocity profile. Uh, I will tell you, we've done a pretty good study uh, and we show while getting the sound velocity profile is, is correct or is, is important, uh, understanding the bathymetry uh, and the bottom type is equally, if not more important. Uh, in errors in your bathymetry, uh, which is the, what the bottom of the ocean looks like from a geography standpoint, uh, and, and, the, and the type of bottom is equally important when you're talking about uh, CZ uh, in bottom bounds. Clearly sound velocity profile in a direct path, close engagement is key, but uh, that the bathymetry and the, uh, and the bottom and type to understand uh, noise loss uh, is, uh, is really important. 
Um, so Charles, thanks for that question. We are uh, driving the in situ measurements um, in, and I'll tell you that that's where my head's at. Uh, when I start looking at where can I invest, uh, it's in the gliders, it's in the profiling floats, it's in the Alamo floats. Uh, and those Alamo floats are, uh, are airborne launched uh, floats. So thank you. Uh, if that, hopefully that answers the question. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, yeah, and not only that, if I could, Frank, not only that, yeah. the data exchange to uh, having a, the, 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 the ocean is just too big for us to go it alone. And so we, we have a really, really uh, strong partnership uh, with a number of like-minded uh, countries, um, Australia, Japan, uh, South Korea, France, UK, Norway, Canada, air, really key areas uh, that have a robust oceanographic uh, data collection. And so uh, I've, got a, uh, I've got a number of uh, exchange agreements uh, with countries uh, like that where we can collect data in and around uh, their, their territorial waters or in, or in a common area in the open ocean uh, and then share that data freely. Okay. Yeah, that makes for it because obviously we, we can't do it alone. We, and we have to rely upon our allies and to help share this information. So I mean, given everything that we've heard uh, with climate change uh, and I know being uh, from the South, especially with the season, with the hurricanes, the way they've been, you know, there's a lot of discussion around that. Do you have any observations of changes in the depths of the oceans with regard to melting of the polar ice? And then I'll add to that, how does that change from an ASW perspective? Does that change anything when it comes to, uh, as you just noted, you know, when looking at below the water, looking for the various CZ and bottom bound zones, is that changing anything with that? Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, and so uh, that top right picture is, uh, one of my sailors from the Naval Ice Center that uh, was at ISEX this past year doing on ice measurements. Uh, and, and what we're finding is the Arctic as the, as the ice is melting up there, it's providing a very, very complex uh, sound velocity profile with multiple, uh, what I'll call French freshwater lenses. So um, instead of having a salinity profile, uh, which is fairly uh, consistent uh, you're, you're seeing uh, large spar spikes as the fresh water either runs off of Alaska from the uh, melting ice or off of the uh, ice cap. And they're settling at different, at different depths uh, and creating a very, very complex, uh, very, very complex uh, sound velocity profile. Mm -hmm. We're working with our friends in NOAA uh, and, uh, and the Canadians uh, to increase and the Coast Guard to increase our operations and specifically our data collect uh, up in the Arctic. So every time we have a, a, a ship that's going up there, whether it's Coast Guard or NOAA, uh, we're putting uh, uh, observation systems up there uh, as well as ice analysts uh, and ice forecasters to get a better understanding of really what's going on uh, in the Arctic. Okay. Excellent. But it is very, it is very complex. Um, that the, the melting ice is, is, uh, is, is creating, uh, is creating an ocean structure that we just, we just haven't captured and we haven't sensed enough. And when you compare it, it goes back to Charles question. When you go back, when you compare it to what we think is, uh, climatology data, it's, uh, it's wildly different. Okay. Okay. Um, what do you think is the most promising technology that's out there? Uh, autonomous uh, swarming, um, uh, unmanned underwater vehicles uh, working with each other uh, smartly. Um, we spend a lot of money uh, putting systems in the water and out of the water, one of. Uh, we really need to start looking at systems, systems of systems that can work together uh, and have increased persistence. So battery technology, uh, underwater communication, these are all key key areas that would be game changers for us. Okay. Okay. Now let me switch gears just a little bit. Um, you know, we hear uh, more and more about the Marines uh, operating more closely with the Navy. Uh, I guess going back to their Naval roots. Do you interact at all with the Marines? I do. Um, so in two, in two aspects, um, 
Well, really three. I have a Marine LNO on my on my staff here to work uh, naval uh, uh, interaction. As you know, the name of my command is not Navy Oceanography; it's Naval Oceanography. Uh, and so we work very closely with our our brothers and sisters uh, on the green side uh, to make sure that the fleet priorities uh, are naval priorities. Uh, second, we have a joint schoolhouse uh, over at Keesler where. Uh, Marine Corps and Navy forecasters and observers are trained. Uh, we've had that for, uh, for, uh, for decades, although the Marine Corps did walk away for five to seven years, but uh, they're back in that schoolhouse. And then lastly, as the oceanographer, the Navy and the resource sponsor, um, I, I, uh, I fund all uh, Marine Corps uh, technology uh, and programs outside of manpower. Uh, so things like the uh, mobile environmental um, a field radar, the mobile environmental sensors that the Marine Corps uses, uh, the Navy purchases those for, for the Marine Corps. So, so bottom line, we have tight, really tight inter, uh, inter integration interaction, uh, not only ashore in our training, but afloat on our ARGs. It's going to be key for Loki and uh, EABO. Okay. So let's, let's turn maybe a little bit you, know, you, you talked about the, the strategic challenges faced by China and Russia primarily. Uh, do you see any of the other state players being a challenge from, from your perspective? Um, but because they operate in a much more constrained maritime environment, are they that big of a challenge for us from your perspective? Uh, China, absolutely. Uh, China is building a Navy of global reach uh, and you can see what they're doing um, through the Indian Ocean and over into uh, into Djibouti. Uh, and they're also trying to get um, uh, increased footprint uh, closer to home uh, in uh, in Central America. Uh, they are not there yet, as I mentioned earlier. They're they're a, a navy that's for the first time in 400 years operating outside the second island chain uh, routinely. Uh, but the 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 matter of the fact is. Well, they're not there yet. They will be there in the near future. Uh, and they're, they're, they're the only real Navy that poses a threat to the American way of life. Uh, Russia's Navy is very robust, very strong, but they're, they're centrally located in a couple of regions. No, no other uh, adversary uh, has, uh, has the capability of those two, uh, e not even remotely close. And so make right. no bones about it. China, China, and Ru China is the pacing threat. Um, they've been okay. building their, they've been building their Navy, uh, over the past, uh, two plus decades, uh, faster than anybody else, including, including the U S Navy. No, yeah, that's what, that's what I've been reading. And I know we've had several discussions around this topic. Let me ask, I got, before I ask, uh, I received one question, but I just one follow one question in looking at the Western Pacific environment and particularly around China and where it's operating in that region. Are there any particular oceanographic challenges that you see that are particular to that region? Uh, obviously anything that, you know, you could discuss or anything. Yeah, so so that's, uh, anytime you're operating in and around a Western boundary current, uh, so in the Western Pacific, that's uh, the Kurosho current, uh, it provides strong acoustic uh, 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 problem sets, uh, whether it's warm core eddies, low, uh, cold core eddies, uh, it's operating across that, um, that, that boundary. It's the same challenges we have with the Gulf stream off the East coast. Okay. The other aspect is there's some, there's some bathymetric features, uh, in the Western Pacific that make it very challenging for long, uh, long range, um, prosecution. Uh, and so we, we've got to get better in the uh, in understanding the the bathymetry west of Hawaii, specifically uh, from Petropavlov, uh, where the Russians uh, have their bases, down through the Western Caribbean. That, but then also in the South China Sea, which is a fairly constrained, but it has some unique oceanographic features that propagate through the Luzon Strait. And I really can't say much more about it, but. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you really need to have a, a keen understanding on both sides of that uh, and understanding how you're going to prosecute in that area. Because once if you can if you can uh, if you can prosecute in south or so, inside the South China Sea, you can you can hold them. But once they get outside that first island chain, they, they, it becomes a, a much 
a more problematic uh, to find and hold contact. Okay. So I have received a couple of questions from our, uh, our uh, I was going to say our viewers, but <laughs> uh, one, um, it, it's not security related, but, how, but are, are there, as, are there any technologies currently available to the military that you expect to reach the civilian landscape in the near future to change storm and flood forecasting? Um, no, uh, n not that I can recall, not for storm and flood forecasting. Okay. Yeah. And so most of my, and I, and I say that because most, I, I could ask my friends and know, but most of my focus is not in and around the U S uh, it's open ocean uh, uh, gray on gray contact. Uh, so I, I really don't, uh, I don't focus my efforts. And the other thing is I don't look to tune or develop my models uh, to be, uh, to, to be good in and around the U S I looked in the open ocean where a lot of satellite data comes in a lot of the in-situ measurements, uh, from my, from our ocean, uh, sensors come in. Uh, the benefit that we have in the U S is we are, we are just data rich, uh, in oceanography in and around our, in and around our EEZ, uh, and, and ashore, uh, the amount of data that our models take in is just it, in some areas of, uh, of of where we operate could be 10 in, in 20 fold uh, compared to what, you know, we're putting into our, our global models, uh, say in the Western Pacific or Indian Ocean. Okay, all right. And then another one, and this has to do with base planning and kind of maybe, it may, it, you may have covered, you know, because your focus is not necessarily in the US, but even, you know, as we expand away from the US and especially that maybe, you know, this deals with, you know, more permanent bases overseas but for base planning, as water levels are rising, are you involved in, in that aspect? And is there a timetable when our bases start to become obsolete if we do nothing now? Yeah, I, I actually am not involved in uh, sort of the infrastructure impact. Um, I'm, I'm more on the physical battle space. Um, our CEC core and the, uh, and the N4, the logistics lead on OPNAV uh, are responsible for it. And I know um, I know they're looking at it uh, closely, not only for the sea level rise, but but the subdation of the uh, of the of the earth in and around those bases. Okay, all right. Um, we're coming up. Uh, we're about at uh, at three forty five. Uh, there's a couple more questions then, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Um, and I ask our you know those listening in, if you got any questions, please. Please go ahead. At the bottom is the the chat box. Please send them to me, and we'll we'll get them out there. Um, and maybe we've already covered this. I guess it's do you think there's an appreciation for the challenges that you're facing within the Navy, and more importantly, within uh, those who fund the Navy. Um, one one big challenge that we have is uh, rec is recruiting and retaining. Uh, personnel, um, and this is where I think you, you may be able to help me, uh, or at least um, uh, if if I can be part of a conversation with STEM uh, in our in our intermediate and primary schools. Uh, it was one of the driving factors why I wanted to bring the USNS more into New York uh, is to is to and we've been involved in every Navy and Fleet Week for the past two years is we're starting to see a um, um, a uh, a significant decrease uh, in, in kids being interested in the physical sciences, oceanography, meteorology, geology, uh, other aspects like chemistry. The, uh, these are all critical skill sets, critical uh, degrees uh, to my community. Um, and we're, we're just having a question about that. Okay, thank you. So we can, we can. Oh, sorry about that, sir. <laughs> So uh, yeah. it. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, the big challenge is uh, is getting these young kids, um, you know, in intermediate and primary schools uh, involved in uh, in the earth sciences. You know, I I, uh, I tell a story. Folks ask me, how did you get involved in meteorology uh, and oceanography? I had a uh, a very energetic uh, earth sciences teacher in ninth grade uh, that that enlightened me into meteorology. Um, and, uh, I just fell in love with the science. Um, I love everything about meteorology. It's just, so I have, I went to school to be a broadcast meteorologist, uh, <laughs> at, 
at Maritime, uh, I found a, uh, a uh, vocabulary as a sailor that's no longer conducive uh, to broadcast meteorology uh, in, in the South Bronx. And so uh, uh, I decided to stay Navy and, and I've been doing this now 29 years and, and absolutely love my Navy. They've given me a great life. <laughs> I can appreciate that comment about picking up a different language <laughs> as I get reminded by my wife every so often. Um, but it, it's interesting because one of the things that New York Council does is quite extensive is we, we help work with the, the junior ROTC programs in our New York City high schools, um, the Navy Marine Corps J, uh, junior ROTC, uh, uh, our youth uh, VP, uh, Evan Dash is listening in. So hopefully Evan uh, will reach out and see what we can do because part of what, you know, part of what we try to do is to expose our, uh, the youth in the high schools that are in these programs. And these are some great kids. After I was there last year, these are some great kids uh, to the opportunities within STEM. Um, I would love that opportunity. We, we did a virtual uh, fleet week in Seattle this year. We were going to, we were planning to bring in USNS Pathfinder uh, into Seattle for, for fleet week. And, um, we, we were able to work through some of the challenges of the virtual aspect. Uh, and we did a number of uh, what we call virtual science camps. Uh, and I would offer that if, the, if that, if that it would be of something of interest to the league that, you know, I could avail my team to do some of these virtual engagements. We, we did some virtual uh, science experiments, some Q and a, uh, a number of them we, we recorded. So if there's an opportunity uh, for, for me and my team to engage there, uh, I would welcome that. All right. We'll see what we can do. As one follow-up question, this is uh, from uh, one of our members, is how hard do you have to fight for funding? And we'll wrap it up on that question. So um, I have to fight pretty hard uh, because I'm, I'm a junior uh, flag officer. Uh, but when the, the conversation comes up uh, to like Admiral Aquilino, Pack Fleet, Admiral Grady, uh, fleet forces or Admiral Burke, um, they get it. They get it. They know not an aircraft flies, a submarine sails or a ship uh, gets underway without naval oceanography. Uh, and so we've been pretty steady on our budget uh, over the last sort of three to five years. Uh, and we're actually growing um, in the next three years as we bring a PAG 67 on. So um, F funding is always funding across the, the Navy is always a problem. Um, what I challenge my team to do is figure out what we can do. Uh, let's do the most with the resources that we got that, uh, that, that it has, but it can't afford the Navy that it needs. Um, it's clear the Navy is, is the most expensive of the sort of four services. Um, and so we, as the Navy leaders, uh, have to be, and, and I applaud Admiral Gil Day and, and the four stars that are doing this, uh, very deliberate in our, uh, in our uh, investment. Uh, not only that, but looking for game-changing technology, leap ahead technology that will get us that uh, information uh, advantage. And so those are things like uh, Newman Neptune, the, the model that we've got coming on. So mm -hmm. uh, long, long answer, but you know, re resources are always scarce, uh, but we're doing the best with what we've got. It's so it's one thing when the Army War College we operate in a resource constraint environment. It's about prioritizations and priorities, and you know, having been for those of us who have actually gone to sea or have flown, we can appreciate the work of your command uh, that we that we use literally every day at sea, and uh, we will continue to advocate as we do. As part of our mission is to advocate uh, both with our you know with our congressmen and our senators. Uh, for support of the sea services and all the requirements that are necessary. And this is definitely one that's vital to, to our success uh, going forward. Admiral, I'd like to appreciate your time today. Uh, it was very, very informative. Um, and uh, look forward to hopefully connecting you with our STEM pro with our youth programs and your command. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's been a very informative talk. And to all those who, who, who dialed in via Zoom. Thank you very much for joining us today. If you are, if you're one that supports the sea services and that's our primary mission, please consider being a member or donating. Uh, as I mentioned, our website, but you know, there's strength in numbers and the more members that we have, the stronger our voice is 
and we are an organization of members, and we drive this issue. So, Admiral, uh, Greg, are you on the line by chance? Okay. Yep, uh, Frank, I'm here. I'm here if you can hear me. Yes, yes. Yes, okay. No, so I'll just close, if I can, by thanking again, adding my thanks to Admiral Loken. Uh, when we, Admiral, when we met you uh, on your great ship a couple of years ago, it was a fascinating uh, and we, we were hosted by you for the reception. It was a fascinating time on board the ship. And I, I knew at that, time, at that moment that we really needed to get you to come and, and talk to us because this is a, an area that's, that's really fascinating from a technological point of view, from a scientific point of view. And I, our members are, are a, a highly inquisitive group, and I'm sure everybody in the audience has benefited greatly from your from your time and your expertise today. So thank you again. Uh, and I would also encourage our audience to please uh, please look uh, for our next event, National Security Briefing with Admiral Sandy Winnefeld on Wednesday, December 9th. And um, let me turn it back to you, Frank. Thank you, Greg. Admiral, once again, thank you very much for your time today. Good luck. And uh, hopefully we'll, our paths will cross soon. Great, thanks, Frank. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for the having Thank you, sir.